What if what if I don't want to start? What then? What if I just sit here without pressing go live for hours and hours and hours? Then maybe oh. one more set of hours, but no more hours after that. Is that six hours? No, four, I think, in total. I think I said hours and hours and hours and hours, so it would be eight hours. Oh. Because it's, it's, it's oh, not hour hours, and hour. Yeah, it's not right. hour and hour and well, hour. Well, it's at hour. least eight hours. Well, it's... Hmm. Because I guess no if, if you've done... Limit. Well, if you've done two hours for the first one, and then you have... Mm -hmm. If you say and hours, then as long as you're adding one more hour, then it's still hours... Mm -hmm. or no because it's yeah, and true. hours it's it's ambiguous yeah like if if we were programming this then it would probably be at least two per set yes but anyways <laughs> you're gonna laugh well, we've been live the whole time <laughs> oh my goodness once again uh fooled by the massive intellect of cory loses will wonders never cease <laughs> oh, okay let's start this Gosh dang podcast episode, please. Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tap Calf Transmissions, the only Star Wars podcast out there at all. So if you've been thinking you've been listening to other Star Wars podcasts, you actually mm -mm. haven't. But you haven't. Uh, That's right. yeah, so we are here to talk about the final of the Han Solo adventures, Han Solo and the Lost Legacy. Mm -hmm. Joining me, Corey Loses slash Corey's Datapad. Corey of Corey's data pad. I'm not the actual data pad. It's my data pad. But uh, anyways, joining me as always is my co-host, Mr. Justin Eckhart's Ladder. I do like the idea that there's some like some creature out there that's Corey and you've just been like his his laptop the entire time. <laughs> his like sentient laptop. I don't, know. I, I don't like that idea at all, actually. So... I don't know why don't you know. do. I think that's actually kind of creepy. Just, I like just imagining this. There's this like giant creature out somewhere who one day will return to like claim what he has lost in the form <laughs> of his data pad. So some kind know. of like Lovecraftian horror. You could be called maybe his lost legacy. Wow, that's uh, that actually ties into what we're talking about today. <laughs> oh, Han was, Solo. That wasn't on purpose. And, I swear. And, and that thing you said. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we're, we are concluding the Han Solo Adventures trilogy. We had to miss out on last week. That's uh, on me, baby. But, uh, but yeah, we're, we're here now. Yeah. Next that's week. That's what's important. We got an exciting one next week, I think. Next week, do we want to say it now or do we want to wait until we're done the episode? Let's say it now. We're going to be because, talking about, yeah. no, justify it. Fine. Go for it. I was just going to say, you know what? Some homies, they just want to pop on and listen to 15, 20 minutes of Han Solo in the Lost Legacy book discussion. I don't think we need to punish them for that. That's yeah, cool. that's fair. That's valid. That's fair and valid. That's even fair and balanced. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are going to be look, talking about the first volume of the 2003 Clone Wars cartoon slash animated series. The, the Tartar series. Sauce edition? Yes, Tartar Sauce edition. <laughs> Uh, we're going to see the super overpowered version of General Grievous and the Mace Windu that annihilates entire armies of battle droids with his bare hands. Yeah. The, the very over the top Clone Wars. The very fun Clone Wars as well. So the way we're going to do this, guys, is it's split into three volumes. I'm pretty sure it's three. So we'll do volume one next week and then we'll go back to a book with the week after that. It will be Isard's Revenge, which is another... X-Wing novel, which I know a lot of you guys are waiting for us to cover. Uh, and then we'll do Clone Wars, and then maybe, like, Children of the Jedi or something after that. Yeah. Or maybe Jedi Prince. I don't know. Uh, we'll figure it out. Don't want to tie ourselves down too far in advance. Oh, That's true. The title is too long, so the Y and Legacy got cut off. But uh, no one cool. on the audio side needs to worry about that. So Yeah. So, yeah, get your... Uh, Get your Clone Wars fix in before next week. As always, if you guys have any comments or questions or whatever else, you can email us at tapcaftransmissions at gmail.com. And so, yeah, my fault on last episode, I don't, I think it was a Gus thing or maybe I was. I think you were I just tired. The, yeah. There was also a day last week where I think it was after we played Sea of Thieves where, let's be honest, dad was a little hungover, a little <laughs> bit hungover. I'm in line with Gus to pick something up. 
the little bugger straight up headbutts me in the temple, the side of the head, like just I'm just holding him. He just full on smacks me. He's completely unfazed. Gave me legitimately a migraine that day. Like I had yeah. to go home and sleep. Yeah, I think uh, I think that was after the podcast was. Yeah, that was happen. after the podcast. I was just but, trying to uh, remember if that was the day. Um, well, the the brain damage you suffered. <laughs> yeah, it makes it all a little fuzzy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think you hadn't completely finished the book until the day of, mm-hmm. and uh, you were trying to time a nap with the rest of the work you had to do, and then finishing the book. So yeah, I very graciously offered to delay it for this week. You did. So you did. So we're here now. Our our plan mm-hmm. for a weekly podcast is still in progress. Yep. But uh, we're, we're finishing we're, Han Solo today. Yeah, we're saying goodbye to the warm and cozy Han Solo Adventures by Brian Daly. Do you want to give your overall thoughts before we get into this book? Because I think our discussion on today's uh, story and today's book will be a little shorter than the other ones because, just let's be honest, we've played out this plot three times now. Yeah, each book is kind of a different version on the same, um, the same kind of general plot structure, which is fun. They're fun. They're they're fine. They're fun books, uh, but they're even like almost the exact same pages. Each one is like yeah. between 180 and 187 pages. Uh, so you guys kind of know this the song and dance by now. Yeah, like he, the basic structure of all of them, especially at Star's End in this one, is Han is hard up looking for a job. Old contact comes back, offers him a job. He goes to some place to talk about the job with this other person. Uh, they don't trust each other at first. Aerial yeah. chase of some kind ensues. They start <laughs> trusting each other. They go to the final planet they're going to be on, have their adventure, find the thing they're looking for. And at the start of the next book, Han is missing money again. But Yeah, uh, they get enough money to repair the Falcon usually and to fix up any small damages, but not yeah. really enough to get ahead. It's, it's really... always going to be enough money to really set them up for life, especially this time. This is really mm-hmm. set up as a as a whole yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. But in so I think probably uh, this one. They kind of undersell the value of the treasure once they find it. I'm really jumping right to the end of the book for this point. Mm-hmm. But it it was really getting me when I was finishing it where it's like, oh, well, this is stuff that's really common. It's like, well, the whole point about these ancient artifacts and stuff isn't like you wouldn't find a like if you were going into an ancient pharaoh's tomb or something, you wouldn't see stuff written on paper and be like, what is this bullshit? It's on paper. We've got a ton of paper. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's still valuable. The problem is that you went and grave robbed it from people who were still there looking after it. It was their stuff and you stole it. This is one of the most, uh, Han has done a lot of fairly ethically dubious things um, in this one. Like, for me, the one that, the, the moment that really kind of jumped out was when he basically allows the the guardians to just ravage that minor camp. Yeah. Despite the fact that we know that, like, there are innocent people there, too. Like, yeah, there are some 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 mean fellas there, but. Yeah, that's where Hosti and Lonnie came yeah, from. That's where, they're like, yeah, exactly. And they're just like, meh. Let it happen. <laughs> and uh, Bollocks clearly had the ability to like alter what they'd be going for. Like, no, just save the Falcon. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, there's there's some questionable stuff there. I mean, we should probably not get too far ahead, though. Like, we haven't even talked about Chewbacca trying to pick up a couple females. That is true. Uh, so, <laughs> as as books so often should. Uh, we open up with Han and Chewie working for an aerial circus on mm. uh, Sahil and Dili, I think the planet mm-hmm. is called. Something yeah. like that. Um, and Well, I wasn't clear if they were going around to different planets or if it was always on that planet because it was a yeah. traveling air circus. Yeah. And uh, this guy who's running it that Han and Chewie are working for... He's kind of a bum. He's just in backwater yeah, he's, worlds. He's like... Not that epic, but like he's no. basically like it's like if you're running like the I don't know, like the air show down in the sticks and like no one's seen a plane before. Like it's you know, it's pretty easy to entertain them. Yeah. Um and Han's like, this guy sucks, like I could do this no problem. Yeah, and after the events of the of the last book, uh Han is still kind of wanted by the corporate sector. Mm-hmm. And that's why we are not in the corporate sector this time. 
We yeah. were in a different but similar <laughs> Teon hegemony. Yeah. Yeah, so and I mean it's still kind of interesting but it's there's a little bit of difference between where they are this time and the CSA because the the Tiana hegemony or I, I got I got some uh some hate for calling it a uh, hegemony. I don't know if that's a if that's a incorrect pronunciation or whatever, but I covered them in a that's video. Fun. But um they're kind of like even more backwater than the CSA. Like the CSA is not an imperial mm-hmm. territory. Um it's very resource rich though. There's lots of big corporations there. They've got um the CSA, all the different arms of the the sort of organization there, the police and whatnot. And then in the hegemony, it's hegemony. more backwater. Um like they, they describe all the technology as being years out of date. A lot of these planets don't really get very much attention. Um, they talk about that a bit when they're on the final planet of the book, and like they talk about how like their the sensor data on that planet's like 140 years out of date because the the surveying is just not working as it should. So it's not a glittering center of the galaxy by any means. Yeah. So this is slightly more integrated into the Empire, mm-hmm. uh, or a lot more integrated than the CSA is, which is fairly independent uh they of course have some local power but the thing that makes uh the Tion hegemony hegemony uh as important as it is is that it used to be one of the main centers of power in the galaxy right pre-republic even so mm-hmm. the kingdom of kron was taken over by Zer, and then his son zim the despot took over even larger parts of the galaxy before losing to the huts and this is something i've actually got some videos that i've been working on coming mm-hmm. out next week uh on so just shameless plug there but the this is a long long time ago they've kind of fallen into uh kind of obscurity and one thing that i was trying to keep an eye out for in this book that i didn't notice any explicit mentions of was Mm -hmm. just how long ago uh the time scale there was because yeah uh, it's it's pretty ambiguous yeah, because like we get mentions of it being pre-republic, pre-republic at least by yeah. uh, implication through the survivors, uh, the survivors, and also Skinks being the uh, the pre-republic expert in this right. area. Yeah. And so then, by just uh, by extension of that, it then has to be about twenty-four thousand years before. So everything we see with the survivors and with the um, with the droids and everything that is supposed to be very 24,000 years old. Uh, mm-hmm. and my take, like the way I was reading, it seemed like when Brian Daly was developing this, he was thinking more on the scale of a couple hundred to maybe a couple thousand years, Yeah, but nowhere near what it ended up being canonically. Yeah. Because it talks about the survivors, like basically shacking up with each other and waiting mm-hmm. for a time to kind of break out of their little part of the galaxy. But, They've been there for like tens of thousands of years and like they've been inbreeding for that long and like, I don't know. I mean, but I mean, it is pretty clear though, like in, in episode four, they he basically, Obi-Wan says that the Jedi, I think he specifically says that the Jedi Knights were guardians of peace and justice in the Republic for a thousand yeah. generations. So that itself kind of sets a timeline for the Republic. So I don't really know. That is an interesting question. I don't really think it gets, we get a very explicit answer though. Yeah, and uh, isn't it all on Duralt? Like, the mining colony's on Duralt, the ships yeah. are on Duralt, the survivors mm-hmm. are on Duralt. Yeah. So this is tens of thousands of years of them being there, basically right next to other yeah. people. Yeah, I was kind of wondering how no one spotted the droids before now. <laughs> yeah. But... Especially but- when Han is talking about how they've done so much to, like fly over and find like they pretty much stumble ass backwards into finding the treasure when it's supposed to be one of the most uh yeah yeah and like and then okay so 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 we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves i think that's fine for this book they basically find the treasure in this place that's already been fully explored but no one had like went down that one hallway before i guess well it's like okay there was the fake vaults that were empty which meant Mm -hmm. no one thought to check just below the back room (laughs) It's like you go into gym class, you open the door, there's like, oh, there's no basketballs in here. And like, yeah, they're they're in the basketball room. (laughs) 
Like, open the door, man. <laughs> yeah, it was the least thorough investigation yeah. of anything that anyone has ever done. And I don't understand how uh, how they never found this stuff. But Okay, John, you got a flashlight so we can check back here? Well, it's on the ship. All right, well, pro it's probably fine. <laughs> Get going. <laughs> it's very and, strange. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they're... They're mentioned as the survivors are mentioned as waiting there for mm -hmm. uh, for their chance to move. And um, they're they're planning to use this uh, this treasure hoard, which includes a lot of war droids, Zim's war droids that were guards on the Queen of Ranroon, which is the treasure ship that Zim's mm -hmm. like that's holding all of mm -hmm. Zim's wealth. Uh, but they're they're planning to launch an attack on the galaxy, and there's a line later on in the book that uh, the reason they're moving now, or the reason they'd be able to move uh, yeah. now, is because <laughs> uh, the Empire has all these troubles, but they weren't able to do anything until now because the old Republic was stable and unbeatable. <laughs> so it's kind of portraying yeah. the old Republic as this unified, pretty strong military power, which is again kind of the opposite of what we ultimately get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. It is kind of the struggles of going off one book or one movie worth of uh, materials, mm -hmm. but definitely not something that holds up consistency wise once you've read uh, or experienced more. Because, like, I can think about 10,000 different opportunities in the Republic era where yeah. they could have invaded and done a lot of damage. Especially um, where they are. They could have just been like, okay, we're ruling ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the one thing that's kind of interesting about the, the like, Teon space as well is that. There is still like a bit more of an imperial presence than the CSA because Han threatens basically like on the first mission they do Han threatens to get like an imperial customs officer down here. Yeah, um, for stopping so an authorized in imperial shipment, the uh, mm -hmm. the authorities on Brigia are going to be uh, cracked down on if they try to interfere too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's it's kind of a, a little bit of a different political setup, although. I think in book two, we also get some mention of like Imperial trading authorities and stuff. So it is still kind of unclear exactly how these semi-autonomous uh, areas of the galaxy work. Um, but that gets fleshed out in other things, especially. The Essential Atlas has a whole um, like couple of pages on client states of the Empire or like independent states like Hut Territory, the Hapens, the CSA. Then there's the Centrality from the Lando books. Mm -hmm. um, so if you guys are wanting to know more about that, you should check out the the Atlas and the Essential Guide to Warfare has some information as well. But mm -hmm. the Atlas is really the there's like if you look at the uh, the Atlas map, I thought it was interesting. There's actually like a hundred or so different um, kind of independent groups in the ga or independent semi autonomous um, factions. Like even Bothan Space says it's given a quite a bit of autonomy, which I didn't realize and thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, like a lot of the early Empire stuff was them trying to reestablish control over like separatist areas or areas that had never really had Republic control to begin with. Uh, so we kind of get a hint at with like Tatooine when Padme is like, oh, well, why doesn't doesn't the Republic ban slavery? Mm -hmm. And Shmi is like, I, no, no. no one cares about <laughs> us. That's like your privilege is showing Padme. <laughs> Which is kind of funny when like Naboo's lore gets fleshed out because Naboo only joined the Republic like mm -hmm, forty yeah. or fifty years before. The moment's just basically like, well, if they're poor, why don't their parents just give them more money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Naboo. People only cared about Naboo because they, there was all the mining going on there. I think. Yeah, well, it covers that a bit in uh, Plagueis. Yeah, um, he's basically taught. I, I really like that part of Plagueis where they're talking about like. Because you see Naboo like kind of go through that process of them adding the new generators and stuff, and that part of Plagueis was really cool. Um, yeah, that book is so good. We got to re. We might have to do a Plagueis reread on the podcast at some point. I'd be down. Me too. It's so it's so reference dense. Yeah, it really is, and it, that's why it'd kind of be interesting to come back after we've read a lot more stories and after we've kind of even gotten better at this whole podcasting thing. Yeah. Um, Cause that was one of the earliest books we did. I think it was probably the first 10 episodes maybe within the first 10. Yeah, it was, it was pretty early. Cause I think we did it uh, just coming out of the X-Wing series. Mm -hmm. so like the, the ones that are chronologically together. 
Yeah. And I think it was like probably seventh or eighth. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Um, yeah, so we got off topic. Um, so it starts off, like we said, with Han is working as basically a mechanic for this air show. Um, he gets out of that and he does a kind of run with some, it's like data tapes and stuff to a planet in the Tion hegemony. Um, they kind of like send him on, on his way though. And he like plays the data over like a loudspeaker from what I remember. It's like five pages in the book. Yeah. This is the, the. Brigia University campus before they head to Rudrig, which is the main campus. And this is when he's with Hissal. Sorry, I, I, I muted my mic there for a second. Oh. <laughs> As I was just talking about how uh, how much better we've gotten at doing the podcast. <laughs> I muted my mic for like 10 seconds and didn't even realize. I was like looking at the, the lines on Audacity. I was like, huh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so it's it's basically just like, again, I don't think the details are important. It's kind of the same setup as we've got in the last two books. There's a little adventure, then we get a setup for a much bigger adventure. Um, so of the three setups, though, which was your favorite? Because I really like Han starting a cult in Revenge. I, I don't think any of them, or I don't think the other two get anywhere near the Han Solo movie theater cult. <laughs> yeah, that one's definitely the... The funnest one. Um, this one I thought was kind of boring and like, yeah. I mean, how do you beat movie theater cult, really? Mm-hmm. Um, like you've got if you were to take like the different parts of the book and splice them together, because mm-hmm. it's the same plot, you can just plug and play different parts of it. <laughs> I think you take that that intro from Revenge, and then you take the uh, the first battle from Star's End. So like getting in yes. with Doc's daughter, yeah, and the Starfighter uh, battle for the sure. Starfighter battle. Uh, cause that's much better than what we get here with the, with the limo thing, except for mm-hmm. what you alluded to earlier, uh, is captain Chewbacca with his mm-hmm. admiral's hat or captain, I think it's on, admiral's yeah. hat from yeah, the admiral's CSA hat. that they negotiated for. <laughs> and, uh, he's got, uh, Chewbacca is legitimately trying to wrangle some tail. Yeah. Like, like, he, like. They they leave a club with Chewbacca. He's got like his arm around these two girls. Like, like Chewbacca's. Isn't Chewbacca's it in the fucking... shower? Like Han goes to see him at the showers, and they're asking. <laughs> oh, if, yeah, that's right. If Han's if uh, like he's here pan, for Captain basically. Chewbacca, so <laughs> yeah, I do like to how Han goes with it. Like he's he, Han is pretty cocky in, in these books, um, but he's like Chewbacca's about to have a threesome. Like I gotta help my dude out here. <laughs> So Han, uh, Han, Chewie, and uh, the two girls are in their limo, mm-hmm. and Chewie's got an admiral's hat on. This is <laughs> this is what needed to be in the essential reader's companion. Yeah, and it's it's also a big character development because I didn't know Chewie wore clothes, and in this book he wears a hat at least for a while. <laughs> well, it's like his bandolier, but yeah. slightly more epic. So he's still hanging dong. It's just this time he's like got a cool hat on as well. Yeah. Um, but so they're on the planet uh, on Rud Rig and Han runs into Badur and this lady that he doesn't really know. And Badur is an old friend of him of his. He owes him a life debt. Um, Badur, I think at first just asks him for transportation. Um, but Han's like, no, we're doing our own stuff. Then he goes off to see Chewie, and Chewie, of course, being the sentimental type and very loyal, is like, no, we have to do this. Well, they also specifically owe Badur uh, a life debt, mm-hmm. uh, or Chewbacca would see it that way, where yeah. Badur saved both of them once and was now asking for this, not mentioning the life debt. But Chewie, as soon as he hears that Badur wanted something, he's like, no, we're. Let's, yeah. let's get this is my there. dude. Yeah. So. He's basically got like a a fix on the the crash of the Queen of Ranrune, which we've kind of alluded to now. It was sort of this old treasure ship of Zim the Despot, who was this big uh, ruler thousands of years ago. Um, and he thinks he's got he, he thinks he's got a a um, a lock on it. And alongside him and his uh, I don't remember what what's her name Hasty Hasty. So yeah. the way they actually got the uh, the lock on Queen of Ranrune 
was that there was a log recorder that was recovered by uh, Hasty's sister Lonnie because they're mm. from they met Badur when they were at a mining camp on Duralt. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Lonnie had been trying to get the information to them, but she was killed by some of the mining colony runner people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rawl, I think the guy's name is Rawl, and mm-hmm. Juwatch. I know Juwatch's name is correct, but I, I can't remember the exact arrangement of R's and A's <laughs> for her brother's name. Some apostrophes there. Yeah, he does He does basically nothing except explode towards the end of the, the book <laughs> while he's trying to skim Han in a... Hans got an AK, uh, basically, boat. and just <laughs> giving it, yeah. Yeah, so he he ends up not being an especially relevant character, but uh, no. uh, Juoch is usually kind of the face of that group, along mm-hmm. with uh, some other guy. <laughs> There's a lot of names by this point, but the important part is that Lonnie has hidden something um Basically, the which will help them find the location of Zim's uh, vault on this planet. So that's where they're trying to go now. And alongside them, they have who I think is actually one of my favorite side characters mm-hmm. uh, we've gotten in these books so far. His name is Skinks. And he's basically like, I imagine him as like a fuzzy caterpillar kind of, like, but larger. Like, he seems so- like... He's like a, a couple of feet long, maybe. Yeah, there's actual there's art not just of Rurians, but also specifically of skinks like reading something, and it's it's pretty great. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna. No, I gotta see this. His he has his initials and everything. S V Skinks. Uh... <laughs> SP, oh, there he is. Yeah, that's, that's basically exactly. <laughs> He's got. A I'm gonna link this on. in the chat because yeah, <laughs> this is this is arguably the best image to ever come out of Star Wars, and. <laughs> For those For listening home, on yeah. audio, yeah, just Google uh, SKYNX Wikipedia. I don't know what yeah. you'd get if you don't put that part, but there is a picture on Wikipedia of uh, Skinks from... And it's not Skinks Nix, the uh, the guy on Kessel. That's, that's different. <laughs> yes. Very easy mistake to make. And when I first read his name, I was like, oh, this is that. No, no, that's not the same guy. For like three yeah, seconds. Yeah, I was kind of thinking ever. that too because Skinks is also kind of a a weirdly uh, he's he's like got a weird body shape too, and he's I remember him being very like slender, and it was like I was wanting the exact same thing. Yeah, it, it was only like a two sentence period where I was thinking, oh, is this going to be him? Because it's Kevin yeah. J. Anderson, so he always yeah. pulls in stuff, but not in this case. Unfortunately, Skinks and Skinks Nicks are different people. It works better this way too because I think Han has a negative opinion of Skinksnix immediately, oh, yeah. and Skinks and this is an absolute bro. Like he gets drunk, he he's cute, uh, he's always curling up in balls. Yeah, uh, he basically so Skinks is like he's basically like an insect alien, um, and he's at like the the kind of early stage of his life, and he's working um, in a university, but later on. Like eventually, once he gets older, he will kind of enter this cocoon phase, and then he comes out as a chroma wing. I think they call it, which is basically like the next stage of yeah, it's like a, a butterfly. Um, and then at that point, he kind of like loses his intellect and becomes kind of just like a biologically uh, driven thing. Like it, it's almost I lose like all sense of myself, point. and then spend the rest of my life fucking before I die. <laughs> Hans like. Hmm. No, but it's a, uh, it's so like that's an, essentially a death for him, especially um, a very intelligent being like he is. So he wants to go on this big adventure, uh, and that's part of the reason why he's doing this, besides the obvious uh, historical value and his role in the university. But I don't know. He's a, he's a, he's a likable, pretty likable character in my opinion. And he does by eleven ABY turn into a chroma wing, so he only has so much yeah. time ahead of him at this point. It's kind of sad, man. That bums me out. Yeah. So, <laughs> went out for skinks, and, uh... <clears throat> oh, well. Tonight, when we play Bureau Card, I'll, I'll pour one out for skinks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they have to go <laughs> get, uh, get the log recorder that Lonnie had, uh, had left out of, uh, out of a bank situation. Where yeah. she's left it, and they they have to like do voice access. So Hasty's mm-hmm. not sure if she's going to be able to do it, but they do. Uh, it does take the the limo attack or 
the attack on the group of them to convince Han and Chewie that they should work together uh, mm -hmm. for reasons. But yeah. Um, yeah, so the planet they're on too, it's like it's this very dull. Alt is like no one goes there. Han's like, yeah, there's like one ship that comes here a year. So it's kind of like an interesting thing where they come out. At first, they're all like very wary, but they think they'll be able to, to scare away any locals. And they sort of do, although some are interested. But then they get attacked by the the mining company that's there. And they're forced to kind of like retreat away from the city. And they go on this very like fantastical wandering through the woods and across this lake and stuff. Yeah, the lake part was especially weird where there's like this weird... Uh... Like a crew like a of whale fish thing. people, <laughs> yeah, who like giant, have a fairy business, yeah, yeah. they're like yeah. giant, giant sapient whales essentially. Um, and there's this one hotshot one that's running the running the lake, um, and he charges outrageous fees, and he's got like this little gang with him. And then there's that guy's uncle who kind of wants to reassert his proper control. He's like, my my nephew is really out of control right now. We got to get back and run this lake properly so there's kind of a little tussle there that han and co are a part of but they get free transport across the lake with uh, nothing nothing worse than a couple bruises those scoundrels yeah it was a really weird section yeah it's kind of just action for action sake really yeah. because those whale things don't appear anymore after that um yeah that's fine so when they get across the lake too they still have a fairly because now they're trying to go to the mining operations because the Millennium Falcon's been stolen. Um, they've got a fairly tough hike. Like, I think they go for multiple days. Uh, it starts off, they're all very kind of happy. They're feeling it. Um, Skinks is really loving this shit. He's playing instruments. Uh, very good mood. But then, you know, the, tr the hardship of their trudge starts to get to them. And... They stop at this airfield where they think they might be able to steal a speeder or something. Uh, Han and Chewie go down to check it out. They find that all the speeders and stuff are basically just they're fake. They're they're basically just cardboard cutouts essentially, although a little more a little more competently made than that. Um, and when everyone's down there checking it out, they get attacked uh, by this group known as the survivors, and they get sort of hauled off into this prison under the ground. In, in the mountain, essentially. Yeah, so these are the leftovers of, uh, I guess, Zim's ship crew, essentially, from the Queen mm -hmm. of Ranrune, uh, who are sitting there waiting for uh, for their chance to attack the galaxy like we were talking about earlier. And yeah. they've been more or less undiscovered forever, despite their whole valley of uh, the... Uh, of the war droids. Yeah, that's a little weird. I just kind of imagine them as sitting sitting out in the open and like <laughs> no one notices them. Yeah, like Galandro and Juoch have been looking for them forever. Everyone's been looking for them forever, but all it takes is wandering into the thing and getting captured. Uh, and yeah, find and Hung gets a look at the face and he's like, they look a little incesty if I'm being honest. <laughs> And they have, spoiler alert, been very incesty for a yeah. long time. Yeah. A lot of a lot of inbreeding, not good stuff. Um, uh, they are big fans of human sacrifice, which is what's going to happen. Yeah, uh, they sort of devolved into like, like tribal, not tribalism. They've devolved into like savagery, I guess, because at this point they're trying to get a, a message out and they're waiting for some communication back, I guess, from Zim. Although, to be honest, they've probably forgotten Zim's name and are mostly just... Uh, like like they're feral at this point, essentially. So they believe that by I, I I'm pretty sure they said that they believe that by sacrificing Han and the others that they can increase the signal strength of this message they're sending out. Yeah, which doesn't seem like that's how their technology actually works. So no, because Bollocks understands them, and this is where they get a bit more information about kind of who the survivors are because he can identify their language as being from the pre-Republic era. So yeah. basically the clue that they've been hanging out in that mountain for a minute. Yeah, so they, they do manage to escape, luckily. Um, yep. And Badur goes and rearms them. He makes a run for their weapons rather than just running out, and Han and Chewie have to save him. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but they get their weapons, they start returning fire at the survivors, 
mm-hmm. and uh, they come across this valley of the uh, of the war droids who. Uh, well, we got to talk about how they, got, how they get down there, though, because that that was my favorite scene in the book. The sledding, remember? Yeah. So there's like this giant dong that's a part of this <laughs> giant dong that's a part of the ceremony um, that they're using as a shield, but they're being completely overwhelmed. So the whole gang basically turns it over like you'd imagine it, and they sled down the uh, the mountain. It's just, I don't know, I thought it was a very fun scene mm-hmm. um, because, like, they're all trying to hold on. Like, Chewbacca's got his legs wrapped around Badur, and um, Skinks is, like, running up their shoulder, grabbing Chewbacca's gun as it's flying off. And, I don't know, it was just, like, it was the most pure, fun adventure scene for me in the whole book, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, and while they're actually in the the prison about to be sacrificed, I think that's when Han tries to kiss Hosty. Well, they and, do kiss, but well, yeah. Is... And then yeah, she basically doesn't... repeats the same line that the that Fiola and uh, or less Fiola. Fiola was yeah Fiola more was different kind of from a... uh, yeah Hosty and the one from the first book, <laughs> but it's the same kind of plot where like Han sort of gets involved with these people and then he's not and then. You'll yeah. just never settle down. It's like, okay, well. Yeah, he's like, she's like, I want to have a farm. Do you even know how to farm? And she's like, I don't want to be a maid on a spaceship, which, you know what? Fair enough. Yeah. Like, a life with Han isn't probably that good unless you are a Chewbacca. Yeah. Like, the Millennium Falcon doesn't even really have a kitchen. It's got, like, a microwave, basically, a space microwave. Uh, we actually do find out that it uh, I know. It has the, the food processors, but it's all greasy, curly, and it's basically just a... The greasiest diner you can think of, and that's what Corellia is as a planet. <laughs> yeah, it's like 1950s America, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool with it. Um, the hydraulics the that they're pictures. talking about in the last book, uh, it's actually based on the grease that gets pushed out of the food processor. <laughs> oh, God. It's like, Chewie, make sausages quick. We need extra speed. <laughs> 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 uh so yeah, they, they they go to this mountain. You were saying they come across the sort of cache of Zim's war droids, which I do think it's mentioned later on. To be fair, that they were moved up there. Like I think they were deeper within the mountain or something. Hmm. But yeah, when when they see them, they're not really they're not right away active or anything. They're just kind no. of chilling. Well, they um, think they're getting their orders about attacking stuff, but Bollocks has to be like, well. You're going to get destroyed if you follow these orders. Humans can be wrong. These orders aren't from Zim. But mm-hmm. uh, the droids are like, no, pretty sure these are our orders. We're just going to go do that now. Bye, guys. Like, Bud, not concerned. <laughs> <laughs> orders are orders. Yeah. So the survivors kind of sick them on the, uh, I guess, on the mining. That part was a little unclear to me. At first, at first, it seemed like they were having them track down Han and co. But then I guess it seemed later like they were setting them on the mining uh, operations yeah bollocks ends up switching them around into going after the mining operations even though right. they were going after han first but they still have kind of right. orders to kill everything and uh, right. oh yeah because he's Han's like, destroy company. everything after you Except like, the follow the tracks then destroy everything yeah right and um, this is where han's kind of dick move he leads them to the the sort of mining operations where Yes, there are some bad guys there, but there are also lots of innocent miners yeah. who surely are killed in the rampage by it's, these unstoppable droids. Everything Han is doing in this book is like questionable at best. Yes. Like they sure they're gonna invade the galaxy, but he didn't know that when he was trying to take their shit. Yeah, and the first book with Brian Daly basically spends like three hundred words per chapter talking about how Han's not a bad guy. This one it's like Maybe Han is a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> the only moment of Han being kind of, there being a little more depth to him is at the very end when he actually finds Zim's treasure before he realizes it's, it's going to be useful or useless. And he's kind of realizing that this might mean that his kind of scoundrel life with Chewbacca has come to an end. Yeah. Well, in the other books, it's usually... Uh, the other protagonists they're saying, Han, you're not as cold as you think you are. But in this one, when he meets Badur and Hosti, Badur's like, yeah, Han, you're a dick, but Chewie ain't. He'll help <laughs> us. And then later on, the only one who says that Han might actually not be a terrible person is Galandro, which mm-hmm. is not really the vote of confidence you want. Who's this, uh, from the previous book, he's a character who was 
just a kind of mercenary gunslinger who mm-hmm. the fastest draw in the West. Uh, he's kind of the, the bridge between Indiana Jones and Han Solo right now mm-hmm. where he, I think he shows up in all the Indiana Jones movies as well. This book was, <laughs> this book was very, very Indiana Jones. Like mm-hmm. like this entire story, if you replace the money, I mean, I guess it's true for all of them, but, like, if you just have, say, the university town being London and the first place being, I don't know, South America or something, this would basically just be an Indiana Jones movie there. Yeah, he's literally going to do excavation of yeah. archaeology shit. So, yeah. And, and do I it improperly, like it... much like Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like, this one to me, like, it almost felt like this could have been an Indiana Jones story. With just you know repurposed, but this is before Indiana Jones. Um, but I, I don't know. I like I like it for that. It's they're very it's very very light reading. You're not gonna have your uh, preconceived notions about the world challenged too much, unless you had a an irrational hate against uh, sentient bugs. But unless you went into the, with this uh, idea of Zim being a, a very peaceful guy somehow. <laughs> He was, in fact, a despot with lots of droids intent to kill everybody. So. Yeah. I was really sure that uh, Bollocks and Max were going to blow themselves up mm. uh, to save everyone. I'm but instead, they what they end up doing was uh, getting the droids to go over a rickety timber bridge and just kind of <laughs> stomp at just the right times that it splinters the wood and collapses them all into a valley. And that's how they're able to to solve that problem. Like, haha, defeated by gravity and forces. <laughs> yeah, so not the smartest droids. Uh, no. The droids are smart enough to recognize humor, but then, like, Bollocks and Blue Max kind of make a reference to a joke on me. Like, huh, is this what becomes of droids? Humor? <laughs> What's wrong with these automata? Um, well, yeah, so Blue Max and Bollocks save the day. They kind of manage to influence the droids. They have everybody, not just Han and uh, Co, but also the remaining miners and stuff. They run across this bridge, and yeah, they, the bridge just ends up collapsing. Um, very sad. Yeah, so they end up For getting them. the Millennium Falcon back. They fly back to the... To with Galandro. Th- with Galandro, who is now working with them. Uh, mm-hmm. But that lasts all of five minutes, because as soon as they get to the actual treasure in the vault, Galandro's like, Aha, I'm going to shoot you now. <laughs> And he wins, but then he runs directly into some armed defense turrets that will shoot you if you run in with a weapon in Zim's yeah, treasure that vault. Yeah, kind of, that was kind of Skinks, Skinks is doing. Like, he pretended yeah. to be completely helpless and uh, goaded him into following him, and he just basically gets, like, eviscerated. <laughs> like he's, he gets pink-misted because there's, like, they're like, yeah, not much of him left. It's like he gets shot by 30 shots. I think it says each one lethal enough to kill him. So. Yeah, there's like uh, there's some warning lights that were in the hallway beforehand, mm-hmm. uh, but Skinks, when he's running away, manages to pull them all off, and <laughs> that's why uh, Galandro thinks he's safe to just charge down and kill him. That but... that is a very Indiana Jones way for a bad guy to die. Yeah, because that happens like every Indiana Jones movie. It's like. Oh, the power of the Ark, or there's a trap that only Indiana Jones knew because he was not an idiot. So, like, yeah, I I appreciated that as well. Well, were these, like, stick-on LEDs? Were they not built into the wall or something? I didn't understand exactly how he was able to remove them, but I'll accept that he did. He he do be having many legs, though. Hmm, That is a good point. He does (laughs) have several legs. (laughs) What more do you need? Do you have that many legs? Didn't think no. so. Got one pair of legs. Arms yeah. As well. So Galandro gets defeated without Han defeating him. So he'll always have that, knowing that uh, Han actually lost to Galandro. I did like that too. That because it was kind of setting it up like, okay, Galandro is good, but Han is really lucky, and he's got that smuggler's ability to get out of situations but no galandro not only does he shoot him once in the shoulder but he shoots him a second time in the gun arm before han can even draw um yeah so han just uh kind of sucks compared to him and he has to live with that so yeah galandro could have killed him had he wanted to um but instead he wanted to basically capture him and take him back to the csa for mm-hmm. other crimes 
Yeah, he says to let him know, just to let people know what happens if you wrong Galandro. But I feel like if he returned with his body, that would have done just the same. Yeah. Just as much good. So like, Han's not going to tell anyone in jail. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't think you get out of a CSA prison once you're in there. Well, unless that prison was Star's End. There was actually a whole book about that. Oh, God damn it. That's right. <laughs> actually, the, <laughs> the only CSA prison we ever see. Uh... Everyone got out, so... Is Stars into CSA prison? Because it's got an Imperial guard there, doesn't it? There were Imperials that came, but... I isn't mean, there, managed, it's still part of the CSA, that, though. Yeah. Was he isn't the Imperial guard or whatever that's there? Uh, I thought he was, like a, like, a high up within the, the CSA itself. Oh, not yeah, the you're right. Governor. He was, like, the He's vice, like vice prex. Or, yeah, you're so right. So it was... It was in most ways, was, at least, a CSA prison. I think I was thinking of the fact that Han and the group pretend to be a uh, Imperial Guild of Entertainers or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so they now, without Galandro, they go and examine the treasures, and they find out to them it's useless, even though it is actually all this ancient, all mm -hmm. these ancient artifacts. I guess they were expecting gold or something, or Star Wars gold, mm -hmm. but instead it's just like ship armor. Uh, like early types of ship armor. Uh, it's like gems, well. but they're made out of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. They're really common gems now, but they would have been really rare mm -hmm. at the time when Zim had them. But I like it's still, this is from Zim's personal collection. It's yeah. of a good amount of value if you sell them to that university. But uh, yeah, it's like he found a cache of vacuum tubes, basically. Yeah. But it's like, these are vacuum tubes used by someone famous. These are vacuum tubes that would have been in big starships. These were the first vacuum tubes. Yeah, exactly. Um, but basically, they're, they had to be satisfied with getting enough. Like, they take enough of the really high-value stuff, like paintings and whatever else, that they can try to sell that and get enough money to, of course, just repair the ship, get Han fixed up because he has been shot twice. Not really. They don't really get further ahead. Um, no, they just get enough to fix up the Falcon and leave again. Yep. Uh, Bullocks and Blue Max, uh, along with Badur and Hasti, kind of get hired by Skinks and mm -hmm. go off for a life of academic pursuits. Han and Chewie are off alone, and uh, Badur, I think it's Badur, or is it? It might be Hasti. Makes the observation of, there go the real survivors, and that's the end of the trilogy. As opposed to the people that they murdered, yeah, on account of how they're dead. I like that for uh, Blue Max and Bollocks. I like that yeah. life for them. I was uh, I was convinced they were going to die before the end of the series. I'm really glad they didn't because I like both of them. Yeah, because they're not really in any other books. Like, I mean, it would have been nice for them to have a run in with Han, but I guess that would be a pretty small universe. <laughs> they actually were the Yuuzhan Vong Hunter droids. <laughs> Can you imagine? They were YVH1 and 7. <laughs> yeah. I Blue Max then that. becomes uh, Ben's nanny droid. <laughs> <laughs> I can pretend. Like, Blue Max could have been inside the nanny droid. Yeah. I mean, it was already creepy enough. It was a fucking nanny droid with a Yuuzhan Vong Hunter <laughs> frame like, and face, I think. Will you milk me, Ben? <laughs> hmm. No. Don't like that at all. <laughs> Listen, I didn't write that. George Lucas wrote that, just like all the Star Wars EU books. Yeah, especially the Mara Jade stuff. George Lucas mm -hmm. was a big fan of Mara Jade. Mm -hmm. But that's basically it for the plot. Like we said, it's very similar to the other two. Um, it's fun, though. I like that this one might have been my favorite, actually. Yeah, because... uh... I'm... This Han trying to... I mean, it has Chewie trying to pull tail, like... How are you delaying on this? There are, like, like I was kind of saying earlier, there were sections that I preferred from each one of them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I have a favorite overall. Um, so the ending was probably the best in this one. The chase, like mm -hmm. the, the middle chase in action was kind of the best in Star's End. The early parts were the best in Revenge, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, so... Yeah, fair enough. And the ending of this one is basically Han and Chewie walking off into the sunset, not having been any richer in anything but friendship, which, you know, it's a fitting ending for these sort of 
pulpy adventure novels, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to? Are we going to rate these like compared to the other books as a whole? Uh, I don't know. Are we? Are you? Am I? Do we have the list? Do you have the list? I've got the list put up right now. Uh, okay. Topped for both of us with the last command and bottomed out for both of us with Kratos Trap and Champions of the Force in slightly different orders. Yeah, I'm going to wait for it to load. It's not quite loaded for me yet. Bit of a stream delay. But if you want to talk about where you'd place it, I'll talk about my placement after it loads. So they're kind of difficult to place for me as a whole. Um, I was kind of worried going into them because they're I'd never actually read them in their entirety before. Mm -hmm. And I ended up enjoying them a lot more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably somewhere towards the top half for me. Oh, wow. But probably in the middle, actually. Uh, I'm probably going to put it between Rogue Squadron and Solo Command, which is... On Solo... Adventures. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I have them twelfth of the books we've done so far, which is about twenty-four ish. So I think that this is where you and I might differ a bit because I like these books. I find them really enjoyable, but like I'm already forgetting like what happened in the first two. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where like if I look at Courtship of Princess Leia, I can remember basically everything. Same with That's Dark fair. Apprentice. Or so for me, I think I'm actually gonna put it. Hmm. I'm tempted to put it second last. Wow. But it's hard though because I really enjoyed reading them, but they don't they don't stick with me. I think I'll put them I think I'll put them right above Dark Apprentice, so under courtship and above Dark Apprentice. Okay. So for those audio listening, uh that puts them for you at I'm just kind of wondering why the hell did I put Wait, Wraith Squadron so low? So what we actually we, we actually got a comment about that. That's the episode that we did with Alex. Um, oh. And we were saying at that point that uh, we didn't see Wraith Squadron as having quite the same character development that we enjoyed out of the Rogue Squadron books. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of And we kind of changed our opinion on that as we went through the rest of the Wraith Squadron books. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just at the time we we were it's kind of hard when we're doing this because we're comparing just stuff that we're reading now and trying to think about how we felt about each book at the time. Yeah. So comparing the character development in Wraith Squadron versus not just Rogue Squadron, but also uh, the other parts of the, the other Rogue Squadron books, yeah. section. So because it's hard to kind of suss out what was going on there. And especially with the Wraith Squadron one, because we were, as you may remember, drinking for about an hour and a half with star wars explained before we started the episode <laughs> uh and there there was a, a a fairly angry comment about how we were too hard on race squadron later so maybe that's Am another I one to bump it up uh you want to bump up race squadron i i yeah, think like, yeah we're able to like it's way too low like it definitely doesn't deserve to be below courts of princess leia or jedi search see i i shouldn't have been lumped in with the with uh with the criticism, because for me, other than Iron Fist, I have it above every other uh, Rogue Squadron book and Wraith Squadron or X Wing book, and it's just mm -hmm. just I Jedi that I have above it, and I I kind of feel like I want to bump I Jedi below it right now. I'm definitely not there. I think I want to move it under. And what happens in Back to War again? Is that the final? That's, that's the, the one, one with they... the Back to War in it. Right, that's the final book of Yeah, Dexwing. that's where Isard goes away. I think I want to move it under Jedi Healer. Uh, so Ray Squadron, you want to move under Jedi Healer? Yeah. Or maybe under under Iron Fist because I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna believe my ranking of two books in the in the same series. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I'll move it below Iron Fist. Okay, so we'll probably have a better way to list these all 
Uh, I do want to put up some sort of spreadsheet or something. And the more we read, we're probably not going to do like individual listings or maybe we will. Yeah. But like this, just to kind of clarify again, this is not us saying objectively these books are better. This is just, this was our opinion at the time. It may change over time, but this was mm-hmm. our impression. Uh, don't take it as like, this is 100% how good each of these books are. This is how it resonated with us at the time we read them. Uh, maybe if we'd read them at a different time, uh, in the context of different books, we'd feel differently about them. Maybe if we do a reread of some of them, yeah. uh, which we talked about with Plagueis, which is right now in second place, we'll change them around a bit. But uh, but yeah, so... It's like even looking at them, like I can't even remember why I hated Champions of the Force so much. <laughs> uh, nothing, literally, that book, sh- nothing happens in it. I think I might have talked you into disliking that book more. No, I don't think so. Because um, after Dark Apprentice, like they resolved the plot in the first five pages of champions of the force and then they introduce other stuff that didn't need to go wrong right because they they kill xr kun pretty quick <laughs> i gotta get a uh, i gotta find the the book in on youtube or something and take a little snippet or something to, <laughs> to include in the podcast all right well we got a couple questions by email we can also take a couple questions uh from the chat we'll do that after Mm-hmm. The email question, so just tag me in the YouTube chat there if you have any questions you want us to answer right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so for those who jump out for the questions, there the next episode will be next Thursday, and we are going to be watching the first volume of the 2003 Clone Wars series. Uh, so if you have any more questions for that, or if you have any questions from anything we've said today, email those questions into tapcaftransmissions at gmail.com. Uh, we do read all the emails, even if we don't necessarily respond to all of them or every point on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, especially today, we have a lot of emails to get through today, which is yeah. good. I, I like the guys are sending us more emails. Um, shall we start? I think the first one we received was from. I don't think we covered Adrian's last time. Uh, we also didn't cover the ads. I think. Oh yes. Oh, did no? Oh, I think oh, we did talk about guard guard team. Yeah, we did. We did. Okay. Yeah, thank God. I didn't realize the 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 subject line is just ads, all caps. Yeah. So, uh, so Adrian's is the first one here. Yeah, Adrian's is kind of just a rebels thing. So I think we'll hold off answering that now. Um, I will say that the world between worlds will probably be get more attention later. Um, but other than that, like we've got too much. Just unless there's anything you want to hop in and talk about there. Um. Yeah, I think some of these are kind of discussion questions that'll come up when, like, there's, we're going to be doing uh, presumably Rebels content. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, like, there's all the talk about there being a Rebel sequel coming out, so I think around yeah. uh, any announcements on that, we'll probably do some sort of retrospective, and yeah. maybe we'll talk about these topics there. How many uh, seasons of Rebels are there? Four? We could four. do, like, half a season per, yeah. per season per episode or something. Yeah, with that in the Clone Wars, there's a few things we'd be able to do. Yeah. I'm not ready to do a Clone Wars rewatch just yet. No. I just did one and <laughs> I'm burned out. Uh, the next one is from Greg, who says uh, he loves our show. Um, I you know you guys are working through some of the last bits of the other book. I'm looking forward to New Jedi Order and Legacy of the Force. If you guys have time, cover the Young Jedi or the Junior Jedi Knight series and the Young Jedi Knights. Um, I think we'll probably be covering all of those. Maybe we might do multiple books in an episode because they are kind of yeah. short. They actually, um, the way they were generally released ended like up being in like together, wasn't three it? in a group or three or four in a group. So there's three the or Shadow four different Academy arcs. Yeah. yeah. And I think those would be uh, good to group because I really like those books. Mm-hmm. Um, Me too. They're, they were my first EU books. So yeah. So I don't, I don't want to sleep on those too much, no. but no. Uh, the think, next question. Oh, sorry. Is it, is it Junior that has Anakin and Young that's... Yeah. Junior is Anakin, Anakin and Tahiri... Tahiri. And, and Young is Ikrit, Jane right? and Jason. Yeah, Ikrit's in yeah. Junior. And then yeah. just explodes in the Vong War. Remember <laughs> that character you loved, kids? <laughs> we killed the family cat. That's that thing. Which which book is it that they come that he goes to Yavin? That is Anakin, right? He goes to Yavin and sees Tahiri. That book is so dark, man. Yeah. Um because Tahiri gets like taken and just like the shit that happens to her is terrible. Yeah, Tahiri gets a lot of bad shit out. Was it uh, Balance Point? I honestly can't remember. 
But but yeah, I, f- I forget which one. I a lot of stuff before Star by Star gets mashed up for me. It's basically Honestly, pre and every post. Everything in the did. Long War gets ma- mashed up for me. <laughs> uh, but Joel <laughs> asks, Star for Star for Star. yeah. Well, that's where like Anakin dies. So there's a very clear difference in tone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much of these books do you think influenced the? T- so this is from Joel. Uh, how much of these books do you think influenced the 2018 Han Solo film? I know that movie took a lot of the basic elements of Han's legends, passed with some changes, obviously. And how do they live up and compare to the movie as well? It's funny because I wasn't a big fan of Solo when I came out. I was, I didn't hate it or anything. It wasn't like offensive. I just thought it was kind of boring. But after I watched it again, I think after we had read the first Han Solo adventure book, and I really, really loved it. Like I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. Like... I guess my mind wasn't ready for like a truly kind of just dumb, pulpy Star Wars movie. Like arguably Rogue One is kind of like that because it's much more self-contained. It's not dumb or pulpy, but it's very self-contained. Um, but Solo is very similar to what like a Star Wars Legends novel would have been like. Obviously, it's not exactly like the stories we have here, um, but it's similar in a lot of ways. And of course probably the star wars book with the most legends references i would guess like zim the despot gets a Mm -hmm. reference in it in the background skulls in it yeah like i think this the tone overall is somewhat similar until Mm -hmm. you get to uh the last bits with the rebellion in solo like all the stuff on corellia is probably similar tone Mm -hmm. Uh, i don't know how much it directly would have influenced it maybe a couple people worked on the movie yeah pulled in some things but i i don't know that it's super derivative yeah i i would agree with that uh next email was from sam hello there from australia Corey and justin uh really enjoy the podcast and share your dislike of corellians and odds and akbar and winter pun and water puns not winter puns uh but he did link us to uh something to add to the pile of akbar x winter co- water content and then i just keep wanting to say winter i don't know why but uh, his personal pet peeve, pet peeve is characters in Zan's book, especially taking a deep breath and letting it out. Anything that <laughs> sticks out to you guys in your reading for the podcast. I mean, I think a lot of it is just like that. Sardonically is... Sardonically. Like, Zan has a his. lot of them. Yeah, there's... Pro- um, warbling. He says the word warble a lot. Like, yeah. droids warble. Machines warble. Um, <laughs> snap hiss, like we said. Yeah. Um, his characters are very, they're they're just funny. Like, you know how Mara's gonna act before she even speaks. So, it's very, but it's good in a way because the characters are very distinct. Maybe a little outlandish personalities, but I like that. Yeah. And thank you, Sam, for the email. Much appreciated, dude. Yeah. For me, the only thing is just like the, a lot of authors relying on characters making references to stuff that happened in the original mm-hmm. trilogies if that's what you need to make it a Star Wars book. And yeah. it kind of feels like they don't feel confident in their ability to just write a Star Wars book. And uh, it's like, oh, remember that time we were in the trash? Com-? Like, they're, they're taking out the garbage. Mm-hmm. It's like, this reminds me of the time we were trapped in the trash compact. You don't need to do it. When well, like, they've uh, done a lot more shit since then. It's yeah. like... Remember the time I shut down all those world devastators? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty epic. <laughs> anyway, next next email is from Asher, um, who asks, if they had made the Throne Children into films in the late 80s or 90s, what do you think the reception would have been? I'm one of those people that I don't think the Throne Trilogy would make a very good series of Agreed. films. Because I think that um, Joris Sabayoth, especially from like a film perspective, is quite a step down from Vader and Palpatine as a, a scary big bad enemy yeah and i think there's a lot of nuance like not really nuance but there's a lot of things in the book that just wouldn't translate well like thrawn strategy and stuff um and it's just not paced well for a movie yeah the changes that you'd have to make to make a good movie adaptation for it i think a lot of people who thought they wanted a thrawn movie would be up in arms about it mm-hmm. and then everyone else probably wouldn't really mind yeah. whether it was that or something else and some of the stuff like Joris Sabayoth and Luke Skywalker mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker uh, mm-hmm. probably would have been uh, not fantastic so we already yeah. got like we already got the Thrawn trilogy as uh, as books and mm-hmm. I'd be all for a movie with Thrawn in it uh, yes. and I think 
Like, I'd be fine with any number of Mickelsons playing Thrawn, but... <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I don't yeah, think... I think an adapt- Brosnan. Hmm. No, I think it has to be a Mickelson. Yeah. Um, Again, I don't care this, which one. I mentioned this, I think, maybe on the podcast, but they do, like, DC animated adaptations of some of their comics. Like, The Killing Joke is the one they did, I think, most famously. Mm-hmm. Um... And that, I think, like, some of those, I think, are beyond movie length. So, like, you could do a series of three animated movies that I think would work really well because the expectations are different. Um, And maybe you could even have Mark Hamill voicing Luke or one of the characters anyway. He Maybe he's too old. But uh, I think that would be cool. Mm -hmm. And then you can have... That's something they could still do someday. I don't know. I don't know. Don't know if it'll ever happen. But there's no... There's no end date because... If you did animate it, obviously Carrie Fisher's dead and the other actors are old. So, yeah, I'd love Luke voicing like, uh, I guess not for these, maybe like Garam Bettlebliss or something. <laughs> Mark Hamill like, doing his uh, Harrison oh yeah, Ford said, impression Luke, to voice uh, to voice Han Solo. Yeah, that'd be good. I, I think that would be fantastic. I'm in for it. Uh, thank you for that email, though. Um, the next one we have is from the review basement. Um, he says, hi, guys, just discovered the podcast yesterday. He basically explains that he was listening to our episodes and then he realized he should go to sleep, which is quite a compliment. Um, so he said he grew up reading the X-Wing series and that those are his favorite series of Star Wars novels ever. And that's probably the opinion I hear the most about those. <laughs> a lot of people really have a love for that, those series and or that kind of overarching series. And I get it. Um, he feels like it's a treat that we're going over it in depth. Uh, he just wants to say hi and introduce himself as a new listener. And he's also from Ottawa. He runs a blog called the review basement. So thank you very much, uh, Josh, for that email. We appreciate those very kind words that all of you have been sending us. And, uh, yeah, we read them all. So thank you very much. Uh... And Javier is asking our top five favorite factions is our Empire of the Hand, Fell Empire, Hapes Consortium, the Mandalorians, and the Chiss in no particular order. Mm-hmm. Do you have uh, Do you have a specific top one favorite faction, Eck? Yeah, I think you know what it is. It's the Legends of New Republic. I love them. I love them. I thought you were going to say the Bakurans. <laughs> I do like the Cyruvi just because of how wacky they are. Um, I don't know if you yeah. saw this, but... I, I'm sure that this information has existed for a while um, in canon, but they posted a new map from an upcoming Star Wars book. And I just realized that Octo is like right in the Cyruvi Imperium. So a little bit interesting way to end episode nine with uh, Ray going to Octo and getting in tech. Yeah. It, was, it would have been introduced and forewarned as well as Palpatine returning. Mm, yeah. Uh, so you what want, you actually, you're proposing right now that the c movie, after having just said the Thrawn trilogy wouldn't have made uh, a good movie series, you wanted, on record right now, the c movie to be the big bads of Rise of Skywalker. Yes, that okay. is correct. Perfect. Uh, Nothing so... I wanted to see more than a group of egg ships. I mean, like, what are those big c movie ships that are just basically eggs? The Shrees, the Lueks, yeah. the yeah. Uh, the Fuesens, the Dekis, uh, all of them are... Off. <laughs> uh, uh, what are, yours are, is the Empire of the Hand, Empire of the right? Hand, yeah. yeah. Well, what at least in in the mod, in Thrawn's Revenge, it's the Empire of the Hand, just because I get to do whatever I want with them. Uh, mm. But in universe terms, uh, I I've never had to think of it beyond that. So, New Republic's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, CIS aesthetically, I really like, even if I don't like them that much individually yeah you love the recusant chiss are an interesting species but they're also like kind of fashy um <laughs> a little more than kind of yeah they're they're explicitly fascist <laughs> um but uh but yeah um good yeah so thank you for that email uh javier let's continue we've got so we uh, did mention uh in the last episode uh, a kind of like analysis slash essay that sarah sent us and we asked her if they're about corn horn 
Uh, and if there was any way, uh, if she wanted to send us a link to put up for uh, where she wrote that, she did send us uh, a link for that, which I'll put in the description here, and we'll also put it in, in the description on the Podbean thing, bean thing, which should get sent out also very, the Spotify very, uh, description and everything. Uh, yeah. So check that out. Yeah, it's a very kind of extensive overview of his history and how corn works. So highly recommend you guys check that out. If you can't um, check the description for some reason, if you look up the meta of corn horn on archiveofourown.org, um, it's by Iron. Iron Ka Feral Kitty. So, yeah, you should be able to find it like that. Honestly, if you search up the meta of Corn Horn in quotes, you'll probably find it. So, highly recommend you guys read that, especially if you are interested in Corn Horn. And as we kind of mentioned, um, it gives a bit more overview of why Corn might be the way he is. Yeah. Which is ranking every woman <laughs> he meets based on. Screw ability. And and we made it to Reddit with that. So that's our contribution to the Star yes, Wars discussion. Mm -hmm. Um okay. So the last one is from the general. He says, Hey guys, love the podcast. I was wondering what an ISB officer was and what time the solo series you're reading right now takes place. So the solo series we're reading takes place one to two years before the events of a new hope. So this is basically what Han Solo was doing right before. And at the end of this, he even mentions um, going to see Jabba. Yeah. So uh, yeah. an ISB officer is basically an Imperial Security Bureau officer. That's what the ISB stands for. Um, they worry about security threats to the Empire um, from outside, but especially in new canon, ISB officers are very focused on like routing out um, spies and uh, people who aren't loyal to the mm -hmm. Empire. I don't know if Legends was like that as well. Yeah, there, there's uh, some shifts that happen with it in Compnor uh, mm -hmm. that I don't remember the exact direction they went in. I think uh, Ilraz ends up taking over stuff with it, but I I can't recite it offhand. But uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think I actually did a video on this relatively recently uh, where ISB and Compnor came up and part of their relationship. But I forget exactly what I talked about there. Uh, but... Yeah, there's the a political element to it. A lot. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. There's definitely a political element to it, but that was mm -hmm. kind of injected later, I think. Uh, yeah. But they're, yeah, Imperial Security Bureau. So in canon, the ISB are mentioned a lot. I think in the, maybe one of the, the early Thrawn books, I think we get some ISB stuff. And then, I can't remember where, where else, but. They're really fleshed out in some of the. Um, uh, they're West End Games, well. I think it's West End Games is Star Wars tabletop stuff. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, sure, they're in like the source, the Imperial source book and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, um, he also asks for good beginner Star Wars Legends books. We should probably do an episode on this someday, but mm -hmm. I recommend pretty much everybody starts with the Thrawn trilogy because it's the most movie like in my opinion. Even though I said it wouldn't make a good movie tone wise, it captures the like the characters and stuff. I'd recommend that. Um, he says he'd like to read Plagueis. Is there multiple? There's just one Plagueis book. Um, I don't think Plagueis is a good place to start uh, yeah, because it a lot of the things that make it as good as it is as a Star Wars book is um, that it is so reference dense. So mm -hmm. and like the way it ties together things, so you'll kind of miss out on some of that. Like you, it's still a good book independent of that, uh, yeah. but. There, I think you'll get a lot more value out of it if you read other stuff first. Yep, agreed. Do you have any starter book that you recommend other than the Thrawn trilogy, or is that your go-to? Uh, Thrawn trilogy is a great place to start. I think if you start with any of the Thrawn trilogy, uh, Rogue Squadron, or you could do Truce of Bakura just because it starts right after, but that's usually seen as like a, a somewhat worse book than the Thrawn trilogy yes. are. Thrawn trilogy is... Uh, doesn't really build on other stuff. Like, there's not too many references to things that would have happened no. that you're unaware of. Uh, it focuses on the main trio. That's kind of yeah. the advantage it has over the X-wing books. Is that the X-wing books are pretty much entirely new people. So yeah. if you're open to that, then X-wing books are a great place to start. If you just want to have some more Han, Luke, and Leia adventures, then Thrawn trilogy for sure. Do you have any recommendations for non-post Endor, like, um? Some of the Darth Vader books, like before Darth episode Lord four, or, yeah, is really good. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people like the Bane trilogy. I'm personally not a big fan. 
Um, I think it's a little edgy for edgy's sake. But yeah, I, I don't think that's a good place to start either. Yeah. Fair enough. <clears throat> Yeah, those are some options there. Thank you very much, General, for the email. We do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, this is one I've been hearing a lot. Corey, is the MC-80 Home 1 really supposed to be the size it is in Theron's Revenge? Because I've been answering this a lot, so do you want to go ahead and... Yeah, so the, the size we have it at is about 3,200 meters. That is based off of some scaling metrics from the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the most commonly quoted size tends to be 12 to 1400 meters makes no sense because of specific mentions in rpg source books that then because they were an explicit number get passed around a lot more and because they were mm -hmm. an explicit number that means they get used on wikipedia which means that people go to wikipedia see that and yeah. think this is the end of the discussion uh, but if you are scaling it based off of any shots in the movies it mm -hmm. is significantly larger because uh, yeah. some of those numbers put it as smaller than so the same places that put the home one at 12 to 1400 meters also sometimes put the liberty as bigger than the home one yeah, which, which is isn't true it's not even internally consistent uh so when you're basing it off of the movie scaling for that it is um it's closer it's at least three kilometers up to potentially five kilometers there's one uh, scene but where the shuttle tidarium leaves where you can you get a look at the hangar versus the shuttle Tidarium and the Millennium Falcon. So you can use that to establish a baseline so like size. And then later it shows a shot of the entire ship with the hangar. So you can kind of get a rough estimate. And I think that average is like like you said, about three point four. Um, yeah. And yeah. That makes sense. Um, is there any other questions? I will just say too, I was got a buzz on my phone and they did announce just now Gary Witta who was the writer for Rogue One will be doing did you ever read a certain point of view no so I think I read parts anthology. of it in a bookstore <laughs> yeah I mean you can do that for that it's, it's an anthology series basically where it takes um, a bunch of stories based on moments from the first one was for episode four so like the gunnery officer in uh, who didn't shoot down the uh, the escape pod as it was leaving the Tantive Four or like people in the canteen or whatever else. Um, so they just announced they're doing one for Empire Strikes Back with 40 authors nice. and 40 stories. So that should be fun. I'm really looking forward to that. The first one was really enjoyable. It was like a basically a Tales from the uh, series. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I think we got two or three more questions from chat. Uh, review basement. Do you think the Han Solo adventure fits well in the over? How well do you think the Han Solo adventures fits overall in the EU and Legends continuity? Uh, we've talked it's about fun. some of the some of the weirdness uh, just as a result of it being so undeveloped when it happened. But because it came first, uh, it tends to be what other things had to refer to, and then stuff like Tion gets pulled out of it, and a lot of other character references mm -hmm. get pulled out of it. So overall, it fits well. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... Han gets... One thing I kind of wish is that they'd set the book a little bit earlier because it's so much action for, like, months before episode four, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, like, if it had been five years before and Han's a little bit younger, I think that fits a bit better. But otherwise, I mean, it's very fantastical, especially this book. Um, Han is tracking down an ancient civilization. Lando will do that as well uh, when we get to his trilogy. Um, but it's fun. It's cool. I like it. It fits. Uh, then Paul is asking, is the new Thrawn trilogy a good place to start? I think it's a good place to start for getting into the new uh, new canon it's along okay. with... Um... I will say, the last two books, they're well written and they're good. But like, especially in the third book, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Because like... so in They the can't really book, go anywhere yet. Yeah, the third book, they are totally, totally locked in, or Timothy Zahn is totally locked in by what happens in Star Wars Rebels. He's got very, very little story to, to tell, and that's a book that, in my opinion, you can totally skip. Mm -hmm. I recommend, for me, I recommend um, Lost Death Stars. Star. Yeah, Lost Stars. Have you read that one? Really yeah. Lost Stars is really good, and even Aftermath, it gets some hate, um, but it it is a, like probably the most full trilogy we've gotten in the new canon so far. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew's asking how powerful really was Stormtrooper armor I mean that just is basically plot how mm -hmm. powerful does the plot need it to be 
Mm -hmm. Uh, RPGs handle it one way. Games handle it another. Uh, Usually it's just more protective than just not wearing Stormtrooper armor. But... (laughs) And thoughts I mean, on the other Hansel we'll talk about that later. You can explain it around however you want, but they got beaten by teddy bears with clubs. Yeah. Um, Temple Institute had a good video on this kind of recently that I liked. I don't know if you saw that. The one about how, uh, like the one that just came out, or yeah, yeah, like basically Kitter whether thing. the Empire could hold Earth. It's like yeah, they stormtroopers also pretty much always just wear white, which isn't a great uh, camouflage technique. Mm-hmm. Um, especially compared to what we have on Earth. But is that it? Do we have any other you'd like to touch we touch uh, on before yeah. we leave? Chloe's asking thoughts on the other Han Solo trilogy. We'll be covering that trilogy on its own, and mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll make some comparisons then, but I think that's it. Uh, we are going to be doing Beerio Kart tonight, so in about mm-hmm. 15 minutes, I think Charlie scheduled it for 15 minutes ago. I think he set it for uh, 10.30. He initially set it for 15 minutes ago, oh, okay. and Oops. now I think it's set for... Uh, 15 minutes from now so we'll be hopping over there on yep. youtube.com slash e-c-k-s-t-o-o that's the gaming channel that uh is featuring both Eck and myself and charlie mm-hmm. uh so we'll be drinking and playing mario kart we're adults yeah i have a child i don't <laughs> all right guys thanks for tuning in just a reminder next week is tartar sauce episode one and Have a good one. May the force be with you. Live long and prosper. Something, something from Harry Potter.